Welcome to Catholic Economics. I'm your host, Levi Russell, and today is July 9th, 2020. Today I want to talk about some responses I got to uh, an interview I did on YouTube on a live stream a couple weeks ago with uh, Charlemagne and Settler's Lament. And I'll leave a link to Settler's Lament, uh, the video, so you, you can rewatch it if you want. It's a two-hour long conversation. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the conversation, uh, but I but I was happy to see that there was also some pushback in the comments, you know, in addition to the guys in the, in the discussion pushing back a little bit on some of the stuff I said. So I think it's a good opportunity in this case to kind of discuss uh, some of the critiques that were in here. And, and, and the interesting thing about it is, is, you know, we didn't just talk about usury in this two hour conversation, but the main pushback I got was on the concept of usury. And I think these are relatively common critiques that we get, uh, when we're talking about usury. And so I kind of want to just provide a, a response to some of these and, and, uh, you know, get feedback from you if you, uh, if you have other questions or if you have other concerns about it, or if you think I'm, uh, reading things wrong, uh, you know, happy to, happy to have that conversation. If you, if you go on anchor.fm slash Catholic economics, just spell it all out in lowercase. Um, or if you use the anchor, uh, app, you can actually leave me a voice message. Um, but you can also catch me on, uh, Twitter at Catholic econ, uh, or search me out on Facebook as well. Uh, so th the thing is here that, um, th this discussion is kind of, uh, I would say typical for, um, you know, usury complaints. And so the first thing I thought was really interesting is that, uh, you know, one of the claims I made in the discussion was that, you know, interest is not, um, you know, some kind of law of law of nature, right? It's not, it's not a law of physics that, you know, someone has to be paid interest on uh, a loan. And so this, uh, I'm going to be reading comments from this guy named Caleb R. I have no idea who he is, but, uh, you know, I wanted to just respond to him. So he says, uh, uh, in response to, you know, my claim that interest is not like the laws of physics, he says, it's literally a mathematical calculation, just as you can find the optimum way to build a building in order to maximize area through mathematics, you can find the optimum allocation of resources to maximize production. Also, first of all, this sounds like, um, uh, I mean, this, this sounds really strangely like, um, it's a, a claim that a, uh, sort of scientific market socialist would make, you know, that we can find the optimum allocation of resources. Um, it also kind of sounds like something you would get from taking like intermediate macro and taking all that stuff very, very, very seriously about, uh, you know, uh, designing an economy and all that. But what, what I think is interesting. So he, you know, the, the main claim here is that, you know, uh, interest is just a mathematical calculation, but, but the problem is that, you know, of course we can apply math to all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's sure it's certain to me, they you know that mathematics is some kind of, you know, fundamental, uh, part of nature. Sure. Um, and that math explains a lot of things in nature very well, but just because I can fit a growth rate on something, um, or just because I can do math to come up with, you know, um, the, the, the total principal and interest paid on a loan doesn't mean that the interest itself is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, is just, is, has no ethical content whatsoever. Right. Um, so, you know, my analogy for this is, you know, just because I can, uh, calculate the, uh, the percentage of people every year who are murdered by abortion, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, because of that mathematical content to my, uh, analysis doesn't mean that, that we are somehow, um, required to kill children, right? Um, it's not like it's some kind of law of nature that we kill children. So I think that one's easily dismissed. Um, so the next thing he says is, uh, I said something like, how do you determine an opportunity cost? It could be infinite. So then he goes on to talk about uh, capitalization rates, which is kind of a weird um, thing to say because, you know, the, the cap rate is, the capitalization rates are basically um, 
if you, if you have a very simple model of uh, finance, right, the asset value is an outcome of the capitalization rate, which is, I mean, it's expressed as an interest rate, okay, uh, and the the uh, income from that asset, right? So you might say something like, uh, you know, like let's say you're a farmer, right, and you have some land, and, you know, you get some kind of income from the agricultural output of that land, and then there's some price of the land in the market, right? Like, so the land itself has some kind of price that you might obtain if you sold it. And, but, you know, like on an annual basis, you, you can produce a certain crop or you can graze cattle on it or something. And that gives you a certain amount of income. Right. And so what he's saying here is that those two things with those two things, you can determine a capitalization rate. But the problem is that just because you can determine a capitalization rate from that does not mean that the capitalization rate is the outcome of those two things. And in fact, actually it's backwards. Um, the, the, the thing that is determined here is the asset value itself. The capitalization rate is sort of like uh, a, a known input into the process of determining the asset value. So I'm not sure what the critique is supposed to be here. And in fact, actually, my discussion of opportunity costs is, is actually more fundamental than his, his I, I feel like it's a red herring about capitalization rates. Opportunity cost is... Uh, a concept is a fundamental concept of economics, and it is applied in the financial world to justify part of the um, you know the interest rates, and specifically uh, you know a, a rate of return on an investment or a loan. And so it's like you know the idea with opportunity cost in this context is that well, if I loan you money, then I could have loaned that money in some other. Uh, possible uh, investment, or I could have used that money on my own to make some kind of an investment, or I could have lent it to someone else. And therefore, you know, adjusting for all these other things, like the risk that you won't pay me back versus, you know, the risk of this other investment that I might have made, you know, paying off or whatever, you know, adjusting for all these other factors, um, you know, I need, I should be able to, uh, uh, take some kind of return from you on my lending um, and, and because I could have earned money somewhere else, right? This is, this is what, you know, opportunity cost is in this context. And I think, again, like, you know, just because you can frame it that way doesn't mean that there is no moral content here, right? So um, just because there's an opportunity cost of my time. I mean, there's an opportunity cost of all of my time, right? And I'm a father. I, I have uh, I have a wife and three children. Is there an opportunity of cost of my time, spending my time with my children? Sure. Do I charge them for it? No, because that's insane, right? And all we're saying with usury is opportunity cost is not an excuse for charging, uh, you know, uh, uh, for charging interest, um, and when I say it could be infinite, I guess maybe that was a little bit hyperbolic, but the reality is that if we use opportunity cost in the context of a loan, we can just simply say that, well, you know, the opportunity, I could have earned, you know, maybe a million dollars from this, you know, investment of a hundred bucks, um, but I'm giving it to you. So now, I mean, you know, there's, there's no limit because opportunity cost is subjective, right? That's the bottom line. Opportunity cost is subjective. Yes, we can try to approximate opportunity cost by looking at similar, quote unquote, similar investments, right? Uh, investments with similar risk profiles. But the reality is that opportunity cost itself fundamentally in economics is a subjective phenomenon. And so there is no way to, to accurately determine uh, what opportunity cost is. We can approximate it, but the, the concept itself cannot be, uh, you know, determined that way. So let's see. Uh, so he talks about the fact that I, you know, discussed that lenders have less risk than stockholders, um, you know, and so then he says, you know, their returns are adjusted and they make significantly lower returns than stockholders in exchange for less risk. Um, well, okay, that's true, but um, first of all, that has no, that's not taking into account any kind of moral um, 
content to this, right? And 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 here's the thing, right? Is this guy is basically uh, equating uh, investment by stockholders, right? Equity investment to debt, uh, and they're not the same thing. And that's okay, right? Just because we use similar instruments in finance to compute these two things um, does not mean that they are sort of like metaphysically the same, right? And this is the distinction that, uh, that some of the best Catholic economists draw here, right? So Father Heinrich Pesch, um, in his book, Ethics and the National Economy, draws a very stark line between um, equity investment and uh, debt, and Vix Prevenit, which is uh, and it's a, a letter from a pope who, that was applied to, uh, it, was a, it was a letter from Pope Benedict XIV that was applied to the whole of the church in the early 1800s by the Holy Office. This, uh, it also draws this very stark line between equity investment and debt. And Father Pesha's interpretation of all this is that if you yourself are investing and taking on the risk of the investment itself, not risk in the sense of, the, the possibility that someone may not pay you uh, pay you back, but the risk of the underlying investment, right? The risk of the business that we're you know going to engage in, right? That's the risk that Father Pesh talks about as being relevant to the the usury discussion. And the reality is that debt holders are simply not on the same hook for that, right? The debt holders receive their um, you know, if we talk, if we want to talk about bonds, right? A bond, the, the thing, the thing that makes a, a the bond return different from, say, um, you know, uh, uh, a dividend payment or something like that, is that the dividend payment is dependent on the profits of the business, whereas the bond coupon, the the bond payments from the borrower to the lender, right, in the exchange of a bond are not dependent on the profits of the business. So therefore, they are not dependent on the fluctuations in profitability. So this is the risk we're talking about. We're talking about the underlying risk of the business. If there are fluctuations in profitability, does that uh, change the return I as an investor get? Well, if I'm an equity investor, it sure does, right? And so that's totally legitimate. I'm sharing in the risk of the operation. Therefore, my investment in that... In that uh, and that business is not usurious. However, on the debt side, um, my my normal coupon that I receive has nothing to do with the profits of the business at all, except in, of course, you know, we talk about the, the failure of the business completely, right? But even then, I'm first in line as a debt holder uh, to receive the assets of the business. So again, even there, I'm not taking nearly the risk that an equity holder is. So I think there's just some imprecision sometimes in the way, uh, you know, we get responses from people. And so then the last thing he says in his original comment here is if he wants to have a conversation on predatory usury, where the poor are enslaved to debt because they don't know better, I'm willing to have a conversation, but to argue against people lending money for capital for mutual benefit, I have no time for you are actively attempting to make a worse world. And what I think is so interesting about this, there, there's two things here. So number one, you know, he, he, he tries to make this distinction between um, taking interest and taking too much interest, right? So the first thing he says, if he wants to have a conversation on predatory usury where the poor are enslaved to debt. Okay, well, normally this is, comes out in the context of uh, usury being really high interest, right? And um, I think it's just very clear from magisterial documents that this is just not the definition, I don't know where this come from. This comes from, but it's it's just nonsense. Um, very clearly in the catechism, the definition of usury is taking of interest on loans. Period. That's it. That's the whole definition. If you look at Vix Prevenit, that one of the first things said in Vix Prevenit is, um, you know, the origin of usury is in a loan contract, right? So it's about borrowing, not how much you pay. And Vix Prevenit specifically condemns this idea that it depends on how much interest is charged. It's just absolutely not relevant. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the last thing that he talks about here is he says, <laughs> you know, he talks about uh, 
uh, lending money f- for capital for mutual benefit. So you know, you know, that's some weird chicanery here in the terms. Uh, you know, capital. Okay, well, in an economic context, cash is not capital, right? Capital, uh, financial capital. You know, we we use that term, but it doesn't. Um, but but we have to be pre- very precise about what we mean here. So if we're talking about capital as uh, financial capital, right, as money invested in a business, okay, well, that's a vague term. Are you talking about an equity investment? Or are you talking about a debt investment, right? And he says, you're actively attempting to make a worse world. And so, you know, this is an interesting thing to me is that it, it seems very, um, gosh, I don't know, like utilitarian or um, it seems to be a very anti-poverty of spirit perspective here, right? So that, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say that usury is bad and in fact, actually it's a sin and that it should be outlawed because of the negative effects it has on uh, uh, on the world, right? So, I mean, obviously, not everything that has a negative effect on the world should be outlawed necessarily. But usury is such a horrible thing, right? It's a sin that cries out to God for vengeance, right? It's such a bad thing, and and its effects on the temporal world, where the state has authority to manage, right? Uh, its effects are so devastating that it should be made illegal. Um, and his concern seems to be that, well, you know, the GDP is going to go down, right? Or, um, you know, things are going to get more expensive because we're not going to have this cheap way of transacting uh, financial capital. Or, um, you know, large institutions are going to be harmed by this and that's going to cause a recession or something, right? There's lots of forms this can take. But the bottom line is, if you want to invest, why not just make an equity investment, Right. The, the point of all of these usury discussions is to talk about the fact that lending at interest is wrong and therefore it should not be allowed, especially because it has a lot of negative effects. Now, is outlawing it going to potentially, uh, you know, create some kind of recession or make us worse off for a period of time? Sure. I, I don't doubt that at all. Is it going to lower our uh, standard of living measured in some way? Right. Of course. But we're not materialists, right? The Marxists and the capitalists are materialists. We're not, right? We're Catholics. Um, just like, you know, the, the constant refrain about trade policy, okay? Yeah, w- we should not be transacting with regimes that uh, are, you know, actively against our interest. That's just stupid. Why would you ever do that? Uh, does, it, does it mean we're going to have less, you know, cheap crap from some of these countries? Sure. Does it mean our standard of living is going to go down because I can't buy cheap stuff from some other country? Yeah, absolutely. But so what? Who cares? It shouldn't matter. So I think, uh, I think that's probably um, enough discussion. He has some more stuff in here, um, but I think it all kind of is, is sort of of the same flavor. Um, so like I said, I'm going to link the uh, YouTube uh video where the discussion was had. Uh, and I'm also going to put a link to my, uh, in the show notes, I'll also put a link to my discussion on Vix Prevenit. And I'll also, uh, I'm going to link my Patreon and my subscribe star. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make this a bigger part of my, my life. And so, um, I, you know, the, the, the Rona thing has not, uh, been good to my employer. So, um, I have some goals on there. I have some perks on there. Uh, if you, if you're part of Patreon or subscribe star, if you want to subscribe that way, that's great. Um, there's also a tip jar on anchor.fm. And I think on most podcast apps, it would be on there. Um, so I'll have links to all that stuff. Um, and so with that, I thank you for listening and I'll see you next week.